The FTT integration standard first came into being as a means to deal with all aspects of multi-vendor device configuration and diagnostic data generated by smart process instruments and to help end users better manage a diverse range of increasingly intelligent assets. Over the years, though, FTT has evolved in both scope and functionality, and in its current iteration as FTT UE for a unified environment, which is based on FTT version 3, it provides a platform of independent, web-enabled environment for managing and monitoring instrumentation and all manner of industrial IoT devices across process, hybrid, and discrete manufacturing devices. Hello, my name is Keith Larson, editor of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com. And welcome to this Solution Spotlight episode of the Control Amplified Podcast, today sponsored by FDT Group. Joining me today to discuss the ongoing evolution of FDT and its increased relevance in the age of Industry 4.0 is Steve Bagaki, FDT Group Managing Director. Welcome, Steve. A uh, great pleasure to talk with you, and congratulations on the relatively new responsibilities there at the FDT Group. Yeah, that's great, Keith. Thanks. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on the podcast today and talk about what's going on with FTT. Uh, and you're right, it is a relatively new role. Um, and I've got, clearly got a lot to learn, uh, but it's been fun uh, starting, you know, getting started with things and, and at this kind of a, a point of transition within the FTT group, the new standard and actually the different devices and the tools and so on to actually enable uh, taking advantage of all the things that were created in the FTT organization. And, and really building on the legacy that the organization's had. So it's kind of cool to be involved as we move forward uh, with the new release of the standard and, uh, and all the tools and the products related to that. So the yeah. automation users can actually take advantage of that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's stunning to think that it's the standard's been around for, what, 20 years, and I don't think we even knew what digital transformation or Industry 4.0 uh, had any inkling of what was ahead uh, 20 years. But that, that's interesting, and it's actually got uh, much cooler names now than it did back in the day. <laughs> when we were to figure out how to, how to do it, what we were doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, I even go back to some of my experiences back in the mid '90s, where it's like, well, yeah, we've been doing this forever. It seems, you know, but uh, yeah, it's definitely definitely taking shape now, and, yeah. and I think a lot of the IT technology, quite frankly, helps us yeah. build much more contemporary things than we used to yeah. do in the past. So. It seems like some of the stuff we were we were talking about it more than doing it uh, back in the day. We, Computer integrated manufacturing and all those. Kinds. Yes, but uh, yeah. finally, the technology is catching up. So uh, yeah, it for sure is. It for sure is. Yeah. I got to tell you one last thing though about just yeah. uh, and, and again about being here, which I think is really great. Is we, we've got tremendous support actually within the FDT group and, and the people that I actually get to work with, and all of our working groups and our board of directors and the member companies. It's it's been really great and a good to. Uh, to see as we move forward with this transition with FTT3. So uh, it's just been a great group to work with. Great and, and welcome. Welcome yeah. back to the, uh, to the, to the, to dealing with the media. We didn't have podcasts back then either. So yeah. Go no, ahead. we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to need. Um, well, just to jump into the, the subject matter at hand here, FTT is really viewed as kind of the, you know, it's de facto industry standard for industrial di device integration, configuration, monitoring. There are millions of, of DTMs, or just to translate for people not familiar, device type managers out there in industry that are delivering data to host systems via older standards, the FDT 1.2 and 2.0 iterations of standard. How, how can users be confident this current FDT 3.0, which is really the foundation of the, the, the UE, um, UE or unified environment, is really the right standard for the next challenges of the industrial IoT and sure. industry 4.0? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the biggest reasons that people can be confident is the fact that the standard, specifically FDT 3.0, uh, which is the basis, as you mentioned, for the uh, unified environment, uh, was was based on user input. Uh, there was a lot of work that was done, you know, obviously prior to my time being involved with the group, but uh, the organization did a really nice job of going off and really trying to understand what users were looking for and how they wanted to actually have access to their data. So I think one of the unique things that I've noticed about the organization being involved with it now is that how user driven it was. It's not a vendor driven standard. It's a user driven standard. At least the requirements were, were coming from the user community. 
And as a result, it actually called out a number of different factors that users wanted. For example, being able to have, um, you know, the idea of open interoperable IIoT or industrial Internet of Things architecture uh, that were somewhat future proof. And a lot of people use that term future proof. What the heck does that mean? Well, the point is, is that, you know, in the older versions of the standard, it was usually a single user view of what was going on with the process instrumentation and the ability to configure almost like an electronic screwdriver in a way mm -hmm. okay to what was going yeah. on and with the new architecture it's actually developed on more of a, a it's actually based on a server-based distributed architecture mm -hmm. that is operating system agnostic device uh, network connection agnostic so supporting multiple protocols and it's vendor independent okay so the standard really enables kind of that true integration of uh, multi-vendor products, multi-network products, multi-operating system products. So kind of took that piece or any any restrictions that could have possibly been in the way. So that's kind of missing out. And the idea of having multiple users now have access to the data. Uh, in the past, it was kind of a single window and single view. Now the data is you know, more uh, distributed uh, through the architecture that's been developed here. I think the other thing is that the idea of to have uh, a comprehensive control and configuration, basically leveraging uh, this idea of a server that's actually been created as part of this offering and part of the specification mm -hmm. that glues the IT and the OT world together. It actually has a server that's part of it that combines both uh, OPC UA to actually talk to the IT world uh, and then also, you know, configuration down to the devices through the different networks and the, the mm -hmm. different field level types of things that are there. So really trying to glue that together, I think is something that users were looking for in allowing the data to be you know, available in lots of different places. And basically what this does is this allows both, you know, IT and I, OT data harmonization, I guess I'd call it, it's probably the best way. And, um, you know, connection with the IT and um, along with actually providing a web server. And so, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, contemporary technologies and how things get done. I think the new spec is actually based on more contemporary type technologies like that, like using, for example, a web server mm -hmm. that actually empowers OT operations, which then does things like, uh, provides for mobility, right? Because mm -hmm. those web browsers now can be used on uh, mobile devices like, you know, uh, handheld, uh, you know, uh, terminals and, right. you know, uh, phones and things like that, right? So mm -hmm. now the data is available across multiple platforms as a result, mm -hmm. where before it was a kind of a single view, right? So it's kind of moving towards that published, published, subscribe top end to go out to all kinds of different devices and systems, yes. whatever, whatever right. you want on that side, which is, yeah, that's right. That's right. And making that just so much easier to actually have to, to deal with. And I guess the, the last thing is that, you know, one of the things, and I think one of the challenges we heard and I, looking back through some of the notes and so on was, you know, how many different places do I actually have to go look for information about the different devices? Like, why doesn't this work more like when you, you know, if you think about get a new printer up to your computer, okay? Mm -hmm. You know, typically it'll go off and find the driver someplace. Uh, right. And you don't have to do that. I mean, I think about how that's changed through the years. We want to do the same thing with the devices. So there is this piece of the architecture and the, and the, and the spec that actually calls out something called an FTT hub, mm -hmm. which actually stores all those parameters. So you don't have to go off and figure out, well, where do I actually find the, you know, the, the description about this device? It's right. automatically there. So, Again, just much more contemporary way to approach things. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So, for the many installations out there that 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 have pre-existing um, FTT servers and embedded in their technology or embedded in their systems, how do they go about bringing those systems forward to the unified environment? And, and you know, what's really the value proposition for for, for yeah undertaking? So, yeah, that's a great question because you know one of the one of the great things about the legacy is that there's tens of millions of uh, DTMs installed out there or devices, mm -hmm. right, yep. uh, that, that use the DTM of 1.2 or 2.0. And, okay, so what do I do about that? Well, the good <laughs> news is, is that, you know, as people see benefits in moving forward to the unified environment, 
all those DTMs that are out there today will work in the new environment. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of a good thing. You don't have to go off and necessarily change out all the devices to have them work as part of the environment. Now, the thing is, it's up to the user to decide, okay, when do I want to take advantages of, for example, mobility? When do I want to take advantage of some of the enhanced security that's part of the unified environment? Mm -hmm. uh, when do I want to do that? So nobody's forced to go do anything. You know, it's, it's a uh, migration path at the time that things are right. And, you know, as we think about it, right, a lot of, you know, the, the control equipment is, you know, is, is had, you know, long life cycle, seven, 10 sure. years. I mean, you don't want to have people forced to change things out. So we're not forcing anybody to do that. But there is an ability to migrate all those uh, devices that are in the field into the new environment when the users are ready to do that. Um, so that's, you know, one of the things to leverage and actually take advantage of that huge installed base and not have people do that. Now, people in the past have only used kind of a desktop version of FTT, okay, right. in the previous release, server version, which is a new thing. So again, if people see the benefit to moving to that server multi-user version, you know, they can go ahead and start moving in that direction when the time's right. Okay. Yeah, I've been uh, covering this whole industrial IoT, industrial, 4.0 for, for for quite a few years now, and and one of the big issues is you know once you start adding more and more of these devices is you know how do you manage all those devices? But you've really extended the concept of FTT to to handle that on behalf of uh, the user community. Is that fair, yeah. fair way to put it? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great way to say it. And uh, again, you know, I think that comes out of the fact that the requirements for the uh, the spec really came out of the user community. So I think that's a that's that's been a key thing. So for companies that want to add a lot of secondary sensors and things like that, the FTT, this unified environment would be a, a great add-on tool for for managing that stuff. Yep, yep, that's for sure. Yep. Integration, configuration, monitoring, those are some of the core strengths we've talked about for FTT. Have have those features evolved further with the, this new unified environment mm -hmm. in terms of the, the strengths and capabilities? Um are there yeah. other, other things to talk about? Yeah, I think there's a few things, right? I think, and in, in, in some of this, I, you know, I'd mentioned, but just to make another point of this, is this whole concept of having the user interface be actually part of uh, something that users are familiar with now because it's browser-based, okay? Uh, in the past, it was more just a fixed application. Now it's much more browser-based, which allows, you know, a common look and feel no matter what type of device you're on. Okay, uh, yeah. when you're looking at devices, I'm talking about from the, kind of the host perspective. So it's web-based. So I think that's one of the things that just provides that consistent user interface. So whether you have a maintenance person out with a handheld looking at a device or you know somebody back in the control room, they're going to see kind of the same thing about the health of the device, what's going on, uh, some of the parameters that are set and so on. That are defined as part of the, the universal information model, so mm -hmm. they're gonna they're gonna see consistency. I think that's one thing right? because of the, the web browser based uh, background uh, you know, technology. I think the other thing is though is that now the data that actually comes from the devices mm -hmm. themselves is available to the IT world. Uh, if you use for if you move like into a server environment where you're using the FTT server, which has an embedded OPC UA server, okay? And now that data is available to, you know, higher level systems, whether that be the MES system, uh, asset management systems, whatever it might be, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. ERP, well, ultimately the ERP system. Uh, so that's another thing, I think. And that the other thing is that there's, there's uh, common parameters that have been defined and standards around how is get displayed um, you know for example uh, diagnostic data mm -hmm. okay we some things to it and adhere to some of the Nemour standards uh, yeah. for how they like to see data displayed and so everybody's got a common view of how that all works now so I think those are the the big the biggest things that have probably changed with this latest release yeah no that makes sense and but it it's not just the configuration data and diagnostics now, it's more and more looking at 
analytics and doing analytics um, through um, data supplied through the FT, FDT server or the unified environment. Is, is that fair to say about feeding into more, yeah. more actual analytics applications instead of just, you know, maintenance and configuration kind of things? It definitely is, which then could be used in other applications, which actually was one of the other pieces of the specification was this connection to other apps, whether it be you know, artificial intelligence or actually even helping do design work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people can now model systems. You know, you think about things like digital twins and things like that, mm -hmm. where, you know, you can actually start to lay out the control system before it's, you have the actual hardware in place, right? So, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Obviously, you're extending the, the scope beyond the, the traditional side of things uh, with process automation. Are there particular features or strengths of FTT UE that make it appealing for more discrete manufacturing environments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would say there are. I think, you know, there's, there's probably three areas that I think we focused on, you know, in the specification and also the ability to develop products in this area. Uh, one is that you know we really focus on configuring intelligent devices used in factory automation so uh, as our friends in japan like to always refer to it as there's fa applications and pa applications okay so you've got factory automation which typically some people may refer to as like discrete applications sure. um, you know you think about stuff that, you know you know from a lot of my background obviously uh, my years in kind of the plc business yeah. You know, we had a lot of different discrete devices, you know, whether they be intelligent photo eyes, variable frequency drives, things like that. Those all can be now have a, a DTM for those um, mm -hmm. to describe how those work. So we're not only focused, I guess my point is, on only process instrumentation. We're also mm -hmm. focused on creating DTMs uh, for discrete or typically, uh, you know, that, that factory automation type devices. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, the example I always used was, you know, the photo eye and trying to configure how that thing sensed, you know, light mm -hmm. operating, dark operating, whatever it might be. There are parameters even in simple devices that have to be set up. Okay. So that's, that's one area. Um, and along with that, you know, I think that we do able then kind of this whole idea of the process automation and the factor automation to work together, which can be used to create hybrid systems. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, you know, several customers, in fact, just recently since I've been involved with the organization that I've talked to that have these hybrid systems, right? And they're not traditional DCS folks necessarily. They're not traditional PLC folks. They're kind of someplace in the middle. They've got a mix of process and discrete devices, and they want to have one view into that system to see what's mm -hmm. going on. And FDT3 and the U unified environment actually help with that. Which, by the way, was one of the ways we came up with kind of this unified environment name around it because it is truly a unified environment yeah. for both process and factory automation. Yeah. And then I think the, 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 the third area really is around being able to configure devices that are independent of any network or device representation. So, for example, there are other standards where people define things, uh, and there's a whole alphabet soup of different data descriptors, if you will. Uh, whether they're IODDs or GSDs or EDs or, and of course, other DTMs, uh, that the FDT UE uh, standard actually incorporates all those different data types that other standards may have you know, created at one time. So, again, truly providing a unified environment. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So, if, if some of our listeners are, are, are wanting to uh, get a more universal device management solution as part of a upcoming line expansion or, or, or retrofit. How do they go about specifying FDT UE as, in, as part of the RFP process? Yeah, so it's actually pretty simple. Uh, <laughs> if, they, if they put in their standard or their spec uh, as they specification, as they do their design work, uh, that they would like their uh, devices to uh, devices and or their system to be uh, FDT3, that's the spec, mm -hmm. uh, compatible, uh, they will get the benefits of the UE environment. Okay. So it's that simple. And, you know, I think there probably are folks that specify, you know, this needs to be FDT compatible. 
to say that they really need to make their stuff say FDT three compatible. Gotcha. Agree. Some of FTT Group's messaging is that the, the new unified environment empowers innovative business models for smart manufacturing. There's a lot of, lot of really uh, buzzy, hypey terms in there. So can you, what does that mean from a more practical perspective to um, system and device vendors? And then what, are, what, are the, what does that mean really for the, the end users as well? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sometimes you got to get through the buzzy, hypey words and actually get to what the heck's that really mean? Yeah. What are those guys saying? Well, I think there's a couple things, right? One is I think um, the part of the vendors themselves and, and, the, and the vendor device vendors, it really allows the device vendors to provide more service and more value mm -hmm. to their end user customers, okay? Now that they have access, they could potentially have access, uh, you know, if, if the user wants to enable them to have that, uh, to the devices and the operation of those devices. So the vendors themselves now can be, maybe adding more value from the standpoint of service by doing predictive analysis on, uh, you know, uh, helping with preventative maintenance, uh, you know, knowing the health of those devices and so on, and being more proactive about, you know, what's going on from actually overall managing the uptime and the utilization of the, of the plant, because now they have clear view into what's going on with every aspect down to the sensor level. Mm -hmm. uh, of that operation. So I think that's one area that from the vendor perspective where they can add value. Um, I think from an end user standpoint, I think one of the, the things that's possible now is the ability to, uh, I guess I'll refer to it as shorten the cycle time from uh, system concept to design to deployment to operate from the standpoint of now being able to use DTMs effectively to model what's going on with the control system mm -hmm. and to be able to go ahead and actually do the entire design, check it out, see if it actually works before they actually buy a piece of hardware. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, you know, the DTMs contain all the information about the different devices that are going to go into the process, I think it's a lot easier to go ahead and try to simulate stuff before they actually, actually start deploying things, uh, which may shorten cycle time, you know, from the, Mm -hmm. deployment of uh, installing a new line or, or adding or uh, whatever might need to happen mm -hmm. to, uh, to uh, you know, meet, meet any of the uh, manufacturing needs that somebody would have. So sure. I think that's probably the biggest thing is mm -hmm. really, you know, because now we have this field, the cloud connection, you know, yeah. clearly short design times for a control system. No, that makes sense. So really using some of that um, data that's in the DTM to enable a, a digital twin type of model. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. That makes sense. All right, great, great. Well, I have to say thanks so much, Steve, for sharing your insights with us today. Um, really best of luck in your new role, and it's an exciting time, obviously, for, for FDT Group um, to, be, to, be, to be launching these new capabilities. Yeah, it is. It is. It's great. And I think uh, it's kind of fun to get involved in something like this and, and uh, kind of keep it moving forward here. So it's, uh, it's a great time to be involved. It's great to see what things happen in the industry. Well, super. And again, we've been talking with Steve Bagaki, Group Managing Director for FTT Group. I'm Keith Larson. You've been listening to a Control Amplified podcast. And for those of you listening, thanks also for tuning in. And if you found this episode informative, you can subscribe at the iTunes Store and at Google Podcasts. Plus, you can find the full archive of past episodes at controlglobal.com. Signing off until next time.